Welcome to the Reality Revolution. Today we will explore a fascinating lecture by Neville Goddard. This one was delivered on March 3rd, 1969, called The Goal of Life. In it, Neville discusses our true goal in this life, which is to find the Father and the phenomena of all life. Neville Goddard was an amazing metaphysical teacher with a very unique perspective of both the Bible and reality creation, the goal of life. Tonight's subject is the goal of life. The goal of life is to find the Father, the cause of the phenomenon of life. The Father has been built in from all eternity within us, for the kingdom of God is within you. You will never find him on the outside. And this God within us is our own wonderful human imagination. So the true and full awakening of imagination is what every man and woman aches for. It is a spiritual event that crowns and redeems experience. It doesn't matter what you have experienced in the end, when you awaken from the dream of life to discover yourself as the Father, then it doesn't really matter. You can forgive all for anything they ever did to you, for you were the cause of all that they did to you and all that you did in this world. Now we are told, He has made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him in heaven and on earth. Ephesians 1.9 Here you and I are members of a body which shared in this glorious purposed end of everything in the universe, the end of the tree, the end of the mineral kingdom, the end of the animal kingdom, the end of man. That proposed end gathered together in one body, and you and I are members of that one body. Now, if this plan is contained in Christ, we have to find out who Christ is. And we are told Christ in you is the hope of glory. Colossians 1.27 Not any Christ of history on the outside, but Christ in you. For it contains the plan. Here is the patterned man. Well, I read his story and see what it tells me. He said, I came out from the Father and I came into the world. Again, I am leaving the world and going to the Father. John 16, 28. Here in four short phrases, we have pre-existence, we have incarnation, we have death, and we have ascension. I came out from the Father. The Father sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. John 12.45 For I and my Father are one. John 10.30 So I sent myself into expression, and here I am clothed in a garment of flesh and blood, yet I am spirit clothed in this limited state called man, flesh, and blood, the limit of contraction. Then I have the experience now of being that's God incarnated. Then I reach the end of my experiences and I have death. Then I return to the being who sent me, and the being who sent me and I, the one sent, are one. For when you see me, you see him who sent me. But in my journey, the purpose is to find and know that really I sent myself, and to know that I truly am the Father who sent me. Well, how on earth will I know that? I search the scriptures to find in what way it could be done, for there is only one God and Father of all. There is only one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Ephesians 4.4 4. Yet I see billions in the world. I am told there is only one Father. Now I want to find out how on earth if I be that Father and I look out billions in the world. They tell me there are three and a half billion today. And there were hundreds of millions prior. They're getting more and more, and yet only one Father. If I find I am the Father, and I look on unnumbered billions in the world, and each will find that they are the Father, how can we be one? Now this is how we discover it. It doesn't make sense. But I tell you, I'm speaking to you from experience. I am not theorizing. I am not speculating. I have experienced it. And so I tell you from my own personal experience how this is brought about. We search the scriptures and we search the Old Testament, but that was the only scripture before the fatherhood revealed himself. 
It was foreshadowed and the whole book is simply a forecast, an adumbration in a not altogether inclusive manner. You have to search it and when you experience it, you go back and you search it again. And then you see what it really meant. But until it's experienced, reason cannot extract it. And there it is in the Old Testament. He said, if I am a father, where is my son? The verse is, a son honors his father. If I then be a father, where is my honor? In other words, where is my son? So I search the scriptures to find out what is this son? Who is this son born and raised in the Christian faith? I was told it was Jesus Christ. My experience does not confirm that. So I started searching the scripture again, went all over the whole book to find that Jesus Christ is God the Father. He who sees me has seen the Father. How then can you say, show us the Father? John 14, 8. I am the way. To what? No one comes to the Father but by me. And when you come to the Father, you are going to find me. I am the Father. So Philip, I have been so long with you, and yet you do not know me. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Well, if he is a father, then he has a son, because the son is the honor of the Father. Well, no one talks about Jesus Christ having a son. We are taught in our churches, the Christian churches, that he was the Son of God, yet he claims he is the Father. If he is a father, then he has a son. Well, now, who is his son? We read scripture. What think ye of the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said, The son of David. He said, Why then did David in the Spirit call him my Lord? If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be David's son? Matthew twenty-two forty-two. A son always referred to his father as my Lord. David in the Spirit is calling him my father. He claims, I have come only to fulfill Scripture. Scripture must be fulfilled in me. Well, what portion of the Old Testament does that fulfill? When David in the Spirit calls him my father, the 89th Psalm, and the Lord said, I have found David, and David has cried unto me, Thou art my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation, verse 26. I go back now to find the second Psalm, and I will tell of the decree of the Lord. The Lord said to me, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. 7. The psalm is attributed to David. From my own experience, I know it is true to have this wonderful experience where your head explodes and then when it all subsides, you find yourself looking into the face of this heavenly youth. You know, without any doubt, there is no uncertainty. You are looking right into the face of your son and he's David of biblical fame. There is no doubt whatsoever as to who he is and the relationship between the two. He is your son and he knows you are his father. It is only then that you know who you are. You have found the father and found him in yourself. You are the father. No one knows who the son is except the father, and no one knows who the father is except the son and anyone to whom the son chose to reveal him. Matthew eleven twenty seven. For the son comes to reveal him. Without a son, no one would ever know he is the father. So we search the scriptures to find the Son of God and find him in David. I have found in David the son of Jess, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. Acts 13.22 Well, Jess means I am. It is any form of the verb to be. What is God's name, I am? When I come to the people of Israel and tell them that the God of your father sent me, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, and they should say to me, What is his name? What must I say? Say to them, I am, has sent me. That is my name forever and forever. Exodus 3.13-15 through 15. Well, Jess is I am, the father of David, but you have to search it. And even when you search it, and reason confirms it, it doesn't make any sense until it actually happens to you. Now, when you have this experience that I have had, you are the father, and there's only one father. Therefore, you and I must be one. We seem to be two. In my own case, I did not lose my identity. I did not lose my individuality. Yet I know I am the father, the father of one. If tradition is to be taken in this secular world, well, he lived a thousand BC. And I was born in this century, but you're told in scripture that in the spirit he called me father. I make no claim of any reincarnation. I do not claim that I lived a thousand BC and that I was Jess, the father of a man called David. No, 
This whole thing is supernatural. The drama is completely supernatural from beginning to end. It has not a thing to do with secular history. So everyone is going to take this eternal story and unfold it within himself. As he unfolds it within himself, he knows he is God the Father. But he can't deny that everyone is God the Father not yet revealed. When it's revealed, we all return to the one God the Father and we, the brothers, form the Lord. It takes all of us to form the one God and Father of all. We are the Elohim. It's a plural word, we are the brothers. So you'll be able to say, as you are told in scripture, the works that I have done you'll do and greater than these you will do because I go to the Father, John 4, 12. You'll continue to fulfill scripture and everyone is going to have the identical experience. So you'll be able to say, go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending unto my Father and to your Father and to my God and to your God, John 20, 17. We are brothers regardless of sex because in the resurrection there is no sex, there is no Greek, no Jew, no bond, no free, no male, no female, and we are above the organization of sex. John 3.28 We are brothers, not creating on a divided image as we do here in this world, but once more returned to the fatherhood that we are. We are God the Father. In this world, we seem to be sinners, horrible beings, the wars, the stealing, the horrors of the world. Well, I tell you in the end, all is forgiven. These are only parts that we, the actor, play, and we are the actor. God only acts and is in all existing beings or men. We are the actor, so a true actor can play the part of a bum, and the part of the glorious one, the part of the pauper, and the part of the fabulously wealthy, if he's a good actor. So God is the actor, and his name is I Am. You meet someone on the street who's begging you for a quarter. There is God. Here is one you read in the paper. He's a billionaire. That's God. Same God. He's not rich because he has a billion and not poor because he only has a quarter. It is God the creator of it all. The whole vast world was created by God the Father and he became man to have the experience of death and to prove to himself that he could overcome death. So I say, ye are gods, all of you, sons of the Most High. Nevertheless, you will die like men and fall as one man, O ye princes. Psalm 82, 1, 6. So one man fell and became fragmented into all the brothers. These are the brothers. Whether you're a lady or a gentleman, we're all brothers. And in the end, we're all God the Father. You return. I came out from the Father and I came into the world. Again, I am leaving the world and I am going to the Father. John 16, 28. Now we are told, I no longer speak to you in figures. John 16, 25. That is, in parable, in allegory, enigmatic statements like saying, I am the door, I am the true vine. But I will tell you truly and plainly of the Father, I am the Father. And that's what he said. He who sees me sees the Father. And now knowing that we are brothers makes the statement, and now may I have told them your name that you gave me. And now the love by which you loved me, may it be in them and I in them, and may we be one as you and I are one. He's praying for the oneness. For what oneness? We are already one, but he's praying for the recognition of that unity, that all will have the experience of being God the Father. There is no way in eternity that I could persuade you that you are God the Father. The only way you'll ever know it is when the experience I have had you have, which is when David stands before you and you know he is your son. Then you see the word of God cannot be broken. It cannot be broken. David says, I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said unto me, Thou art my son. Today I have begotten thee. Psalms 2.7 As a Christian, I was taught to believe that these words were addressed to Jesus Christ. I know today these words were inspired by Jesus Christ, not addressed to him. He inspired them and then came in to fulfill them. I have come to fulfill scripture Scripture must be fulfilled in me. Luke 22, 37. So he comes in and takes upon himself the limitations of the flesh and blood and is born of woman and becomes obedient unto death, even death upon the cross. And this body is the cross. This is the only cross. 
friend of mine asked a question here last Friday, and I did not have the true answer. I confess I had not yet looked up that word in the concordance to give it its original meaning. The question he asked was, what is the word carpenter? For we are told in scripture, is this not the carpenter? Is he not the son of Mary, the brother of James, the brother of Simon and Jose, and Judas and his sisters? Are they not with us today? How does he know these things? Well, at the question period, he asked the question concerning carpenter. My concordance, which is James Strong's concordance, defines the word in Greek as to produce from seed as a woman, a tree, the earth, to be born, to bring forth, to be delivered, to be in travail. So here is one who comes to fulfill the promise. The word Moses is also defined as the old perfective of the Egyptian verb to be born, not yet born. It's something to be born. And here comes one who actually unfolds the entire drama within himself. So here, something is to be born. Well, the carpenter is that which is to be delivered, to be born. Now you and I, reading it superficially, will think of the man's trade, one who builds a house or repairs a house. Yet the actual meaning of the word as originally used was simply to produce from seed. Well, the seed was in the Old Testament. That is the foundation. That's the seed plot of the entire book. Now he comes to fulfill it, and he only fulfills scripture. He doesn't change anything in the world. He doesn't say we should not have a Caesar who rules it. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. We have no description of the man in scripture, whether he was blonde or dark, tall or short, no personal description. Here is a pattern man, a plan contained in every man, and every man contains Christ, for Christ in you is the hope of glory. Colossians 1.27 So the goal of man is to find the Father and it comes in the most dramatic manner. You are first awakened within yourself. You find yourself completely awake in your skull. Your skull is where you were buried. That is Golgotha in which Christ is buried. God actually enters the human skull and lies down in the grave and dreams himself you. At the end of what span of time I do not know. People speculate as to 6,000 years, 8,000 years, but I have no experience concerning the time. So I cannot tell you from experience. I only know that one moment you begin to awaken, an unusual vibration possesses your head and then you can't stop it. You can't arrest it and suddenly you find yourself waking. But it's unlike any awakening you've ever experienced before. You awake within your skull. You are fully awake and you are completely sealed in. There's no outlet. You intuitively know it's an innate knowledge that if you push the base of the skull, you can get out. You push the base of the skull and there's an opening. You squeeze yourself out head first and then you come out inch by inch. Like someone being born from a woman, only you're born from the skull. You look back and here is that out of which you came. Your body, this little garment that your physical mother wove for you. That is the linen cloth of scripture as you look back and see it lying there and then the entire drama as told in the book of Matthew and Luke surrounds you. You are invisible to those who you see but here is the infant that is presented and it's yours. They know it's yours and they call you by name, your earthly name and they tell you it's your child. They don't see you because now you are spirit so it's God that is born and you come out of the garment that you wore. That comes to an end and then 139 days later is when you discover the fatherhood of God and discover that you are the father. A similar vibration starts in your head and when it reaches the limit of intensity you explode. Your head seems to explode. Then standing before you leaning against the side of an open door is your son David of biblical fame looking out on a pastoral scene. You see him so clearly and well you can't describe the beauty of David. It's beyond description. The relationship is so established there is no doubt whatsoever he is your son and you know it then that comes to an end and then 123 days later comes the third grand event you are split from your head to the base of your spine and your body is actually in two parts from top to bottom you're split and one side moves this way and one side moves that way again in fulfillment of scripture and he stood upon the mount of olives and the mount was split from east to west. One side moved northward, and the other side moved southward. Zechariah 14.4 You think it is a mountain in the Near East? No, you are the entire scripture. It's your body. For we are told in scripture the curtain of the temple was his own flesh. You see, your 
entire body split right down and then at the base of your spine is this pool of golden liquid light. You contemplate it and strangely enough, although it's a pool of living light, you know it is yourself. As you look at it, you fuse with it and then like a serpent up you go into your skull and it reverberates like thunder as told in scripture. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up. John 3 14 so you go right up right back into the same area that the father has built in you he's built within us right into this area as though you're only a brain only this fantastic head that is yours then 998 days later your skull becomes luminous translucent there's no circumference infinite transparency and hovering above you about maybe 20 feet is a dove the dove looks lovingly at you and you automatically raise your hand as you are told in the story of Noah. He struck his hand out and the dove lit upon the hand and he drew her in unto himself. Genesis 8, 9. Well, the dove descends as though it's floating, descends upon your hand and then as you draw it to your face, it smothers you with affection, kissing your face, your neck, your head. While it is absolutely smothering you with love, a woman at your side will tell you that he loves you, and it is so obvious that he does. And she will tell you in a strange way that they avoid man because man gives off such an offensive odor, but to prove his love for you, he penetrated the ring of offense and came down to demonstrate his love for you. While he is demonstrating his love in the form of a dove, the whole thing comes to an end. Then you add all these little numbers up from the very first one when you awoke in your skull to the end, the first from the first day to the second experience, 139 days, from that day to the third experience, 123 days. And from that third to the fourth one, 998 days. They come to 1,260 days. The number given in Daniel 7.25 and Revelation 11.3. The child was born. And then 1,260 days elapsed and the entire drama is coming to an end. Then all you can do is tell it. Some will believe it and others will disbelieve it. But all you can do is tell it, because eventually, even those who disbelieve will have the experience. Not one can be lost, not one in eternity. The most horrible creature that walks the face of the earth will eventually have the experience. Though he stands today and claims he is an atheist or agnostic, it really doesn't matter. Let him claim it, and let him have fun. In the end, we will all know from experience there is God. Only the fool will say in his heart, there is no God. So the wisest of men who today claim there is no God, they are wise in their own conceit, but in the eyes of those who know they are fools. They may have all the degrees in the world behind their name, oh, very wise, and make a nice big impression on those who are equally stupid, but you know, there's an awful lot of learned ignorance in the world, so it doesn't really matter what they claim or what they do. I'm telling you what I know from experience. I'm not theorizing, I'm not speculating. There is God the Father, and don't look for Him outside of yourself. You'll not in eternity find Him in any place other than yourself. When you find Him, you are God the Father. And yet you are weak as all outdoors in the world of men. I stand before you just as weak as any man in the world, with little of the world's goods. And yet I know what I'm talking about. I have to continue in this weakness while I wear this garment of flesh. And when I take it off, I return to the being that I was before I sent myself out. Returning, I am one with the risen Lord. There's only one body. How can one body contain all? Well, how can your one brain contain billions of cells? So our brain finite, yes, it's finite. They could be numbered if one is capable of doing it, but still finite. If it can be numbered, but it would run into unnumbered billions, and we are told in Scripture, He has put a limit to the peoples of the world according to the number of the sons of God. So there will be no more in the world than there are sons themselves in people. So every child born of woman is God incarnate. I don't care what the child is, any pigment of skin, any race, any nationality, that is God incarnate. There can be no more bodies in the world then there are sons of God to wear them, and sons of God wear all the garments in the world. And so we are simply fighting each other, fighting our own brothers. Madame Schumann Heink, maybe you don't know her, a grand old lady of the opera, a great singer of the Germanic world. 
She had six sons. Three fought in the First World War on the German side and three with the British Army. She traveled around the world and had her sons in different parts of the world. Here the poor soul was distraught. She was caught here when the war broke and she knew three sons were fighting with the Germans and three with the British. The Countess, I knew her well. She came to all my lectures in New York City. She had similar experiences. She had sons too divided. They were born in different parts of the world and when war broke the Second World War, the Germans called up her sons who were born on German soil and the British called up her sons who were born on British soil. Who knows if one was killed that it was not his own brother who killed him. Yet whoever was killed, it was his own brother anyway. If the German was killed by a British, even though he had no one of the physical descent, he still shot his own brother. And shooting his own brother, he shot himself, because eventually we are all the same father, all the father of one and only son. And that one and only son is David. There is no other son, and one day you'll find him. How to persuade people who have been conditioned to think otherwise? I know it's difficult because raised and trained in the Christian faith as I was, and I called myself a Christian, it would have been difficult to persuade me using only your vision to persuade me. I was so completely trained in the belief that Jesus Christ was a unit that was different and he was the son of God. I went to my school. I studied scripture. We had it every Sunday in Sunday school. But where I was born and raised, we also had it in our schools. We had it to study scripture. I couldn't find in scripture that David was the son until I had the experience, and it's the most difficult thing to persuade anyone to modify their concepts and come forward and hear one who has had the experience. So after he tells you that no one knows the son but the father, and no one knows the father but the son, and anyone to whom the son chooses to reveal him, Matthew 11, 27. Then he goes on to say, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Well, the yoke is simply a word for teaching. We speak of the yoke of the law, the yoke of adoption. Now he is speaking from experience and he's asking those to exchange yokes. You've been taught this, that, and the other. And I'm telling you, I've experienced scripture. So take my yoke upon you and learn from me because eventually you're going to have this experience. Everyone's going to find they are God the Father. And you'll never know you are God the Father unless the Son of God stands before you and calls you Father. And you know it, it's no longer the play. This is now the reality. And you know you are the father because here comes David. He's a youth about 12 or 13, handsome, beyond the wildest dream of man. You can't describe the beauty of David because he is the quintessence of all the experiences that you, the father, had in this world. I have found in David, the son of Jess, a man after my own heart who will do all my will, Acts 13, 22. So the part you're playing does all your will. And in the very end of this eternal youth, which is the quintessence of your experience in the world of death, stands before you and reveals you are God the Father, who is the cause of the phenomenon of life. So the goal of life is to find the Father. We are led astray. We think it's to make billions of dollars or to become popular, to become famous. Well, these are things on the outside. I'm not denying that they are interesting, but this is not the goal, the goal of life is to find the Father, and the Father is built in from all eternity within the individual born of woman. One day he's going to find the Father. To the ladies, let me tell you, you will not be surprised when you know you are the Father, for in the resurrection you are above the organization of sex, and you will not be surprised to know that you are the Father and he is your son. And he has no mother that he has begotten of you as a result of the experiences in this world of death. All of this is a result He is the result, the end result, and he is as perfect as you are perfect. He is beautiful beyond measure, and so are you. That day, you awaken to remember the being that you really are, but you had to forget it. Empty yourself and become obedient unto death, even death upon this cross. Philippians 2.7, you dwell upon it. This may not seem to you tonight a practical lesson, but I've always felt that what is most profoundly spiritual is in reality most directly practical. Your Father, which is yourself, knows what you need. You dwell upon this and things will be good in your world. You don't have to seek the individual thing like a better job, this, that, and the other. If you want to, you may, but you pursue this and He, the being that you really are, knows your need and you'll get it. But in the end, in my own case, this is my last round. Whenever the day comes, if it's tonight, 
When this is taken off, I will not be restored to life, as all must be restored who have not had the experience of the discovery of the fatherhood. No more restoration to the garments of flesh. I ascend to the being that I really am, and that being is God the Father. Everyone who has the experience that I have had when they reach the point called death, no more restoration to garments of flesh. They ascend to the being that we are, and that one body is made up of all the redeemed, all who are resurrected. As told us in scripture, they die no more. Why? Because they're sons of the resurrection, sons of God, and can die no more. Read it in scripture, Luke 20, 35, implying that if they haven't had the experience, they must continue to die. But there is no death, not for the immortal God, for death here is simply going through the door to find yourself restored and clothed once more in a similar garment. But young, not a baby, but 20 years of age, same being that you are now in a world terrestrial just like this, where you're afraid of death as you are here, where you marry, where you struggle, where you do everything just as you do here until you find the Father. When you find the Father, there are no more restorations in garments of flesh and blood, but ascent to the being that you really are, God the Father. At the end of these lectures, Neville would give two minutes of silence followed by questions and answers. Now, let us go into the silence. Now, are there any questions, please? Question inaudible. Neville says, you'll find that both in Matthew and in Luke, try the 20th chapter of Luke. The question is asked by those who do not believe in the resurrection. And they said, Master, Moses in the law said that if a man marries and dies, leaving no offspring, and he has a brother, the brother should marry the widow and raise up issue for him, the brother who died. There were seven brothers and one died leaving no offspring and the second one married her then he died leaving no offspring and the third took her eventually all married her and they died leaving no offspring and eventually she died so they asked the question whose wife will she be in the resurrection 2028 now not believing in the resurrection they did this to trip him and he said you know not the scripture and then he explained that happens to men who die he said in this age men marry and are given in marriage but those who are accounted worthy to attain to that age unto the resurrection, they neither marry nor are they given in marriage, for they cannot die anymore because they are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection, Luke 20, 34. So we marry, and we are given in marriage in this age. So he speaks of the two ages, one in this world where we create on a divided image, and then in that world where we are unified in the one being, which is God the Father. But it comes only after the resurrection, you cannot enter that age by doing things on the outside in this world. 
It can only be done by being awakened while in this world. You are awakened in the grave and the grave is your own skull. You are actually buried in your skull, which is called Golgotha, which means skull. That's the cavalry. Luke doesn't even use the word Golgotha, and when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him, 2333, and then he was buried near to the place of crucifixion, the skull. Man thinks he's going to find the grave in the Near East. Well, he'll dig forever and he'll never find it. He never was buried there. He's buried in the skull of every little child that is born of woman. That's the universal Christ, the universal diffused individuality. And eventually, all are gathered into the one being, the same being that came down. Question? I don't understand coming from the skull and the number of days and from one experience to another, coming into this world or going out. Neville says, no, my dear, no. The days that I mentioned are 1,260 days, as told us in the 12th chapter of Daniel. And he said, I heard it, but I did not understand it. And they said, close the book, Daniel, until the end, 12.9. He could not understand what he heard, but the man spoke telling him of a time, times and a half a time. Well, a time is a year, times would be twice that amount. That's now three years. And then a half time would be three and a half years or 42 months. The ancients divided a year into 12 parts of 30 days. Now you count them up and you come into the book of Revelation and it spells it out as 1,260 days. Revelation 11, 2, 3. So from that moment, you are awakened within your skull and you come out like one being born and the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes confronts you and that unearthly wind possesses you. Then men come to bear witness to the event, and they surround the garment out of which you emerged. Now that vanishes, and they remain, and they find the infant on the floor. One announces, calling you by name, that it's your baby, and it brings it over, and it places it on the bed where the body was. The body is no longer there. You pick the infant up in your hands, and you speak in the most endearing terms to this infant wrapped in swaddling clothes. While you're completely entranced with this beauty, this little child, it breaks into a smile. The whole face becomes one wonderful radiant smile. You are told, I will give you a son and his name is Isaac. Genesis 17, 15. The word Isaac means he laughs. That's what the word means. I give you that which he laughs and it's only a sign, a sign of your own birth out of the world of death into life eternal. Now count 139 days and the event of the fatherhood of God comes upon you. Then comes 123 days and the splitting of your body from top to bottom comes upon you. Count 998 days the dove descends upon you and smothers you with love. Put them all together and they come to 1,260 days. You simply fulfill scripture. Question, was that actually your experience? Neville says, my experience began on the 20th day of July, 1959, and then on January 1st, 1963 was the day of the descent of the dove. So July 20th of this year, it will have been 10 years since I've had the experience. So I'm talking from my own experience. I'm not speculating. It's only in the scriptures, but I did not know the scriptures until I had the experience. I thought I knew the Bible. I've been teaching since 1938, the second day of February, 1938, but I did not know anything but the law. I didn't know the promise, and this is the promise fulfilled, but the law, I thought I knew it. I know I know it, and I can teach it. Next Friday will be the law, the game of life, and how to play it in the world of Caesar. That's Friday. But this is the goal of life, and you can't play it, only faith. The promise is made, and you walk by faith. You set your hope fully upon it, upon the grace that is coming to you at the revelation, at the unveiling of Christ within you. And Christ within you is God the Father. If he is a father, and he is a son to bear witness to his fatherhood. Therefore, who is the son? Well, David in the spirit called him father. But people don't see it. I have talked with rabbis, with priests, with ministers of all denominations of the Protestant faith. No one would even give an ear to it. They're as blind as blind can be. They are blind leaders of the blind and both fall into the ditch. They don't know it and they are unwilling to listen to one who has had the experience. Yet they go back to their books, which they always carry in their hands for show. You see them on the subways in New York. Each of them has a book, and he's not opening the book. If he does, he's not reading it at all. At their age, they need glasses, and they aren't wearing glasses, so they open the book just for show. I'm not speaking of that. I've gone on the radio with them in all-night sessions, six hours, three ministers, a rabbi, a psychiatrist, all these so-called learned men. Well, they completely close the mind when it comes to my revelation. 
Yet I'm telling you what happened to me, and it's all in scripture. But the mind conditioned is a strange thing to recondition. Try to recondition the mind. A man comes to this country, and he seeks the freedom that he feels he will find here. He finds it here, but he was born in some other area of the world and his heart hasn't left it. Let something come up between this country and that country where he was born and he finds his little mind going back to protect this little land. Something tells him that this country may be right in the ultimate, but no, he's going to go right back and pick up the argument as the little country now presents it. It's so difficult to overcome and recondition the mind. So you go to school. I was beaten once in my life in school, an unmerciful beating, where you brought blood from the buttocks down to my knees. For in those days, they were allowed to beat the children. Corporal punishment was in order. He had a cane. You could bend it around this way. He asked me a question and I quoted the Bible. Take up thy bed and walk. He said, bring me your book. I didn't have my Bible with me. There were nine boys and a girl and you aren't going to have 10 Bibles in this house. So I told him that my brother had it that day. That might have been a lie, but I said my brother had it. So I couldn't produce the Bible. He goes back into the room and brings out the long cane, taps it this way on the bench. I had to kneel on the bench and he starts to beat me unmercifully. He was a sadist. He blew his brains out a year later. He was simply taking it out on the boys. The boys would come to school padded from their buttocks down with all kinds of funny leather books and everything else because they knew that someone had to be beaten that day. He took something out on the boys to give himself. It could have been an orgasm, I don't know, but he had to beat in order to get his own emotional thrill. And I was the one that day, that night when I undressed and my father discovered it was my brother Victor. Victor said, Daddy, come and see what they've done to Neville. My father came back and said, take off your pants because at dinner I didn't sit up as I should. And my mother said, come on, sit up, Neville. Well, I had to sit up, my mother told me, but the pain and all the blood. When he saw what the man had done, he started to dress and Wilsey knew exactly what he was going to do. My mother's name was Wilhelmina and he called her Wilsey. She said, Joseph, don't. He said, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him tonight. And you know, he would have if he was not restrained. So I never went back to that school. I was taken out of school that night and sent to another school. It was the one time I was severely beaten and that was for quoting the Bible accurately, but... His translation said couch and mine said bed. Take up your bed and walk. And his said take up your couch and walk. This was the excuse to get someone beaten, just a sadist. Well, I'm not a masochist, so maybe it was a good thing that I was beaten for the Bible. So in the end, he is, if it drove me to a greater search for the truth, then that is in order. Until Friday. And that concludes... The Goal of Life by Neville Goddard. We have heard the story that Neville has said about being beaten, and I've always wondered if this unique experience of being beaten for not properly quoting the Bible had some sort of significant effect on him in later years, as he was very adept at understanding the Bible in multiple ways, and perhaps this particular experience affected him deeply. This lecture is like many of the other lectures that Neville gives on the promise with some minor tweaks, some little things that were said, but basically pretty much the same. It's just very powerful and inspirational. And this is the goal of life. It, it really is to find the creator within us, to understand that the cause of all things is this God within us, that we are this God, the father. I have not experienced the promise can't wait to experience it. I still have my questions and doubts. As he says, you will never truly know until you experience it. We are the Elohim, as Neville says. It's a plural form. When we talk about oneness with the law of one, he is teaching the law of one in a biblical manner. He is teaching that we are all one, that we are all brothers, even if we're all sisters and brothers. We are all one being. And we are going to experience a revelation of this. I'd love to get your impressions of this particular lecture. And once again, I always ask if anybody has experienced the promise in any way, please give me your details of it. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution.